Welcome, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to what, by my count, is the 39th Lee Page Lecture Series. Um, these lectures started 49 years ago to honor the memory of Professor Lee Page, who was a professor in this department, the physics department, from 1916 until his death in 1952. Today, it's my great pleasure to uh, be introducing to you John Preskill, who is the Richard Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics at Caltech. Uh, John got his PhD at Harvard under Steven Weinberg. <clears throat> and uh, his career is noted for an amazing breadth of, uh, of activity. And that started even back then, when he was working on both uh, technicolor alternatives to what we would call now the standard model of particle physics, and also uh, a cosmological production of monopoles a problem that was eventually solved by inflation. Um, his work in particle physics, cosmology, and gravitation led him in the early 90s to be working on uh, quantum black holes and interesting problems associated with quantum information in that system. And that, that theme of quantum information has, been, uh, has marked his work since that time. In 2000, uh, John became the founding uh, the, uh, the found, he founded the, the Caltech Institute for Quantum Information that's now an NSF frontier center, and it's now uh, referred to as the Institute for Quantum Information and Matter, and he's the director of that institute. Um, if you've looked at the titles of his three talks, you'll know that he has a, a wide breadth of, of, of expertise and, and will... Uh, be able to enjoy that through these three talks. It'll also be our pleasure to enjoy his clear lecturing that's been rewarded twice by the Associated Students of Caltech Teaching Award. So please help me welcome John Preskill. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm excited to be here at Yale, one of the world's great centers for quantum computing research, and quite honored and humbled to be the Lee Page lecturer. My talk today is about quantum physics and also about information. We all recognize that we have impressive information technologies today, but we also know that those technologies are going to be surpassed in the future by new technologies that we can't really expect to imagine today. It's interesting, just the same, to speculate about future technologies. I'm not the ideal person to do that. I'm not an engineer. I'm a theoretical physicist and not really all that knowledgeable about how today's computers really work. But as a physicist, I know that the crowning intellectual achievement of the 20th century was the development of quantum theory. And it's natural to wonder how the development of quantum theory in the 20th century is going to impact 21st century technology. Quantum theory by now is a rather old subject. But some of the ways in which quantum systems differ from classical systems, we've come to appreciate only relatively recently. A lot of those differences have to do with the properties of information encoded in physical systems. To a physicist, information is something that we can encode and store in some physical system, like the pages of a book. But fundamentally, all physical systems really are quantum systems governed by quantum mechanics. So information is something that we encode and store in a quantum state. And physicists have recognized for a long time that information carried by quantum systems has counterintuitive properties. That's why we like to speak about the weirdness of quantum theory, and we cherish and take pride in that weirdness. But we can also ask whether it's possible to put the weirdness to work to exploit unusual properties of quantum information to perform tasks that wouldn't be possible if this were a less weird classical world. And that desire to put weirdness to work is driving the emergence of a field that we call quantum information science, which gets a lot of its intellectual vitality from three main ideas, quantum entanglement, quantum computing, and quantum error correction. And in this talk, I'll try to explain these ideas. I'd like to start at the beginning. You know that 
Any amount of classical information can be expressed in terms of indivisible units of information, bits. And we can think of a bit as an object, like a ball, which could be either one of two colors. And I can take a bit and I can store it inside a box. And then later on, when I open the box, the color ball that I put in comes out again. So I can recover the bit and read it. And quantum information, information carried by quantum systems, too, can be expressed in terms of indivisible units, what we call qubits or quantum bits. And for many purposes, it's useful to envision a qubit as an object stored inside a box, but where now we can open the box through either one of two complementary doors, those doors corresponding to the different ways in which we could prepare or observe the state of the qubit. And I can put information into a qubit through door number one or door number two, and later on when I open the same door, the color that I put in comes out again. I can read the bit just as though it were classical. But on the other hand, if you put information into a qubit through door number one and then open door number two, then even though we know exactly how the qubit was prepared, we can't predict what we'll find. We'll see either a red or a green ball, each with probability one half. So that means that in order to read the quantum information, you have to do it the right way or you'll damage the information. And you can appreciate one consequence of that if you think about copying quantum information. Suppose I had a quantum copy machine, what would that mean? It would mean that if I had put information into a qubit through door number one, then I could make a copy of the qubit and open door number one on the original and the copy, and the color that I put in would come out of both doors. On the other hand, if I had put information into door number two and made a copy, then I could open door number two of the original and the duplicate, and the color I put in would come out of both boxes. But in fact, there's no such physically possible machine. We can't copy an unknown qubit. And the reason is that the copier has to probe inside the box to make the copy. And if it guesses correctly the door that I use, then it would be able to copy the ball just as though it were classical. But if it guesses wrong and opens the wrong door, then it will damage the information and there won't be any way to build a high fidelity copy. So we might be able to clone a sheep, but we can't clone a qubit. Now, as you've seen, I like to think about qubits in kind of an abstract way. That's often useful. But qubits can have many possible physical realizations, and I'll mention a few others later. But if you'd like something to con concrete to think about, you could imagine a single photon, a particle of light, which has a polarization. Its electric field, say, can be oriented either horizontally or vertically, corresponding to the two states that we can see when we open door number one on the box. On the other hand, we can consider polarizations along the 45 degree rotated axes corresponding to door number two. So I could make, for example, a horizontally polarized photon and then measure the polarization along the tilted axis. And I wouldn't be able to predict what I'd find. It would be one polarization or the other, each with probability one half. Now, the really interesting differences between classical and quantum information can be appreciated only when we consider systems with more than one qubit. So let's suppose we had two qubits. They could be far apart from one another, one at Caltech in Pasadena, the other in the custody of my friend in the Andromeda galaxy. And some time ago, these two qubits were both on Earth, and they interacted, establishing a correlation between the qubits with some interesting properties. Namely, for this particular state of the two qubits, I can open my box through door number one or door number two, and either way, I just find a random value with probability one half of being red or being green. And the same thing is true for my friend in Andromeda. He can open door number one or door number two, and either way, he just finds a random bit. So neither one of us by opening the box, acquires information about the state of the box. And that's kind of peculiar because with two qubits, we should be able to store two bits of information. Where is that information hiding in this case? 
Well, the answer is that all the information is actually encoded in the correlations between what happens when you open a box in Pasadena and a box in Andromeda. Because it turns out for this particular state of the two qubits, I can open door number one or door number two and I see a random bit. But if my friend opens the same door on his box, he'll see the same thing that I saw. So if we both open door number one, what we find could be red or could be green. But it's guaranteed to be the same for both of us and the same thing if we both open door number two. And we know this is true because we've tried the experiment a million times with identically prepared pairs of qubits and it always works this way. Now, there are four distinguishable ways in which a qubit in Pasadena could be correlated with a qubit in Andromeda. We could see the same color or different colors when we both open door number one or when we both open door number two. And by choosing one of those four ways, we've encoded two bits of information in the two boxes. But what's unusual is that that information is inaccessible locally. It's stored entirely in the correlations, and I can't acquire it in Pasadena or my friend in Andromeda. And that property of quantum information, that it can be shared by two distantly separated parts of a system, is what we call quantum entanglement. And it's the really important way in which quantum information is different than classical information. Correlations themselves are not unusual. We encounter them all the time in daily life. My socks are typically the same color, so when you look at my right foot and observe the color, you know what color sock to expect when you look at my left foot. And you might think it's pretty much the same thing with the boxes. If I want to know what my friend will see when he opens door number one in Andromeda, I can open door number one in Pasadena to find out. If I want to know what he'll see when he opens door number two, I can open door number two in Pasadena to find out. So aren't the boxes just like the socks <laughs> No, they're really fundamentally different. And the essence of the difference is there's just one way to look at a sock. But we have these two complementary ways of viewing a qubit. And that makes the correlations among qubits much richer and more interesting than correlations among bits. This phenomenon of quantum entanglement, strange correlations between parts of a quantum system, was first explicitly discussed in a paper by Einstein and collaborators over 80 years ago. And to Einstein, quantum entanglement seemed unsettling to indicate that something's missing from our current understanding of the quantum description of nature. And that paper elicited some thoughtful responses, including an especially interesting one from Schrodinger. And Schrodinger put it this way. He said, the best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the best possible knowledge of its parts. So what Schrodinger meant was that even if we know as much as can possibly be known about the state of our pair of qubits, one in Pasadena and one in Andromeda, as much as the laws of physics will allow us to know, I'm still helpless to predict what I'll see when I open the box in Pasadena or open it in Andromeda. And it was Schrodinger who suggested that we use the word entanglement to describe this unusual quantum correlation. And he added, it is rather discomforting that the theory should allow a system to be steered or piloted into one or the other type of state at the experimenter's mercy in spite of his having no access to it. What Schrodinger meant by that is it seems strange that it's up to me to decide by either opening door number one or door number two in Pasadena whether I'll know what my friend will find when he opens either door number one or door number two in Andromeda. But Schrodinger understood well that these correlations don't allow us to instantaneously send a message from Pasadena to Andromeda. When my friend in Andromeda opens his box, through door number one or door number two, he just observes a random bit, irrespective of what I did to my box in Pasadena. So there's no communication of information from one box to the other. Nevertheless, there are unusual correlations between the two qubits. Now, this idea of quantum entanglement didn't advance very much for the next 30 years until the work of John Bell in the 1960s. And with Bell, we started to think about entanglement in a somewhat different way, not just as something strange about quantum theory, but as a resource which we can use to perform useful tasks. 
Bell described games that two players can play. The two players, Alice and Bob, are cooperating. They're both trying to help each other win the game. And these games have the following structure. Alice and Bob each receive inputs and they are to produce outputs that are correlated in some way that depends on the inputs that they receive. And they're allowed to use correlated bits that might have been distributed to them before the game began. But under the rules of the game, they're not allowed to communicate between when they receive their inputs and when they produce their outputs. And for this particular version of the game, if Alice and Bob play the best possible strategy, then average uniformly over the inputs that they receive, they can win with a probability of at best 75%. But there's also a quantum version of the game where the rules are the same, except that now Alice and Bob are allowed to use entangled pairs of qubits that were distributed before the game began. And using those qubits, they can play a better quantum strategy and win the game with a higher probability of success, about 85% instead of 75%. So they've used the entanglement as a resource to do something to win the game with a higher success probability. And experimental physicists have been playing the game for decades now and winning with the higher probability of success, which Bell pointed out quantum mechanics allows. So these super strong correlations, which are different from the correlations in classical systems, quantum entanglement, really do seem to be part of nature's design. Einstein derided quantum entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance, which sounds especially derisive when you say it in German. <laughs> but nature is the way she is, as experiments reveal her to be, and we have to learn to love her as she is. So boxes are not like socks. Quantum correlations are different than classical correlations. Quantum entanglement is something new. You can win a game with a probability of success 85% instead of 75%. Is that really a big deal? Yeah, yeah, it's really a big deal. And you're going to begin to appreciate why it's a big deal if you think about systems with more parts. Imagine a book. It's 100 pages long. If this were a classical book, written in bits, then every time you read another page, you'd learn another 1% of the content of the book. And after you've read all 100 pages, you'd know everything that's in the book. But now suppose it's a quantum book, written in qubits instead of ordinary bits, and the pages are highly entangled with one another. That means when you look at the pages one at a time, you see only random gibberish. You get almost no information that distinguishes one highly entangled book from another. And that's because the information isn't written on the individual pages. The information in the book is encoded almost entirely in how the pages are correlated with one another. That's quantum entanglement. And what's interesting is that these correlations are extremely complex. So that if I wanted to give you a complete description of all the correlations among a few hundred qubits, if I wanted to write down that description using classical bits, then I would have to write down more bits than the number of atoms in the visible universe. So it's never going to be possible, even in principle, to write that description down. And that feature was very intriguing to the physicist Richard Feynman. It led him to make this suggestion in the 1980s that if we could operate a computer which processes qubits instead of bits, then we ought to be able to perform tasks that wouldn't be possible with ordinary digital computers. What Feynman had in mind is that if we can't even write down using bits the state of a quantum computer with a few hundred qubits, then by processing the qubits we ought to be able to do things that an ordinary digital computer would never be able to emulate. And when Feynman was making that suggestion in the early 1980s, there was an undergraduate student at Caltech studying mathematics named Peter Shore. And like all Caltech undergraduates at that time, he was required to study quantum physics as part of our core curriculum. And like many of our undergraduates, he retained what he learned. <laughs> and some years later, put it to good use in making a remarkable discovery an example of a problem which we believe is hard for ordinary digital computers 
is factoring, finding the prime factors of a large composite integer. And what Shore discovered is that with a quantum computer, factoring isn't a hard problem. It's not much harder than multiplying two numbers together to find their product. And when I first heard about this in 1994, I was really awestruck. Because I realized what this means is that the difference between hard and easy problems, between problems that we'll be able to solve with advanced technologies and problems that will remain intractable even when we have very advanced technologies, that boundary between hard and easy is different in our world because it's a quantum world than it would be if this were a classical world. I mean, that was one of the most interesting ideas I'd ever heard in my life. Now, to give you an idea of what it means, an example of a factoring problem that we can solve with existing technology is factoring 193 digits. Uh, that was done some years ago now using a network of workstations that collaborated over the internet and it took a few months. And from what we know about how the difficulty of the problem scales with the number of bits, we can estimate how long it would take that same hardware to factor a 500 digit number and it would take longer than the age of the universe. So the difficulty of the problem scales very unfavorably as we increase the number of digits. But suppose we had a quantum computer and imagine that it has the same clock speed as that classical system. It can perform the same number of elementary operations on pairs of qubits per second as this classical system can perform elementary operations on bits. So we have to imagine that because we don't have that now. But if we did, factoring 193 digits could be done in much less than a second, and factoring 500 digits in just a couple of seconds. So the difficulty scales in a much different way as we increase the number of digits if we have a quantum computer running Shor's algorithm. Now, does anybody care whether factoring is a hard problem or not? Yeah, quite a few people care about that. Because the security of widely used quantum uh, sorry, not quantum, <laughs> widely used public key crypto systems, the security of those systems is based on the presumed difficulty of factoring and other related number theoretic tasks. When quantum computers are widely available, as they might be in a few decades, then those protocols will become vulnerable and we'll have to protect our privacy in other ways. There are alternatives to using the current public key systems, but it's still not clear what will be the best way to protect our privacy in the coming post-quantum world. Well, the broader lesson that we learn from Scher's algorithm and other related algorithms is there's this interesting classification of problems. There exists a family of problems which are classically hard but quantumly easy that quantum computers can solve and ordinary digital computers can't solve with reasonable resources. And it's important to understand better what are the problems in that intermediate class that are quantumly easy and classically hard. We've made some progress on that in recent years. But I think from a physicist's perspective, what's most important about quantum computing is that we believe, though we don't really know this for sure, that a quantum computer would be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. That's not true for ordinary digital computers, which cannot simulate very highly entangled quantum systems. With a quantum computer, then, we'd be able to probe the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials, and also study fundamental physics in new ways, for example, by simulating high-energy particle collisions or the quantum physics of a black hole. Now, there's a lot of theoretical work being done on quantum algorithms that could run on a quantum computer, but we don't have the quantum computers yet, so it, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes. My friend Eddie Farhi wrote a brilliant paper not long ago about a new application for quantum computers, which inspired me to send him this poem, which reads in part, we're very sorry, Eddie Farhi, your algorithm's quantum. Can't run it on those mean machines until we've actually got them. <laughs> and the poem goes on, but you get the idea. <laughs> we have lots of ideas about what to do with a quantum computer, but we don't have one yet. So why is that? Well, it's really, really, really hard. 
Part of what makes it hard is that we have to overcome a formidable difficulty, what we call decoherence. Physicists like to envision a cat which is both alive and dead at the same time. We're funny that way. But we never in our everyday lives see cats that are both alive and dead at the same time. They're always completely alive or completely dead. And we understand why that's true. It's because a real cat will interact with its environments and those interactions with the outside world in effect measure the cat and project it onto a state which is either completely dead or completely alive. That's decoherence. And that phenomenon of decoherence is very important in helping us to understand why even though quantum physics holds sway in the microscopic realm, classical physics gives us a very adequate description of most macroscopic phenomena. Well, a quantum computer too, though we may try hard to prevent it from happening, will interact with its environment. And those interactions will in effect measure the quantum computer <coughs> and spoil the coherence of the information it's processing, which will cause the quantum computer to fail. So if we expect to operate large-scale quantum computers successfully, we have to find a way of fighting off the effects of decoherence and other possible sources of error. Errors are a problem even in the classical world. We all have bits that we cherish. Everywhere it seems there are dragons lurking who delight in tampering with those bits, changing the color of our balls, as it were. But in the classical world, we have learned how to fight off those dragons. If I have a classical bit that I want to protect, then I can store some backup copies of the bit and the dragon may come along and change the color of one of the balls, flip one of the bits, but I can employ a busy beaver who frequently checks to see if the three colors match, and when they do not, the beaver repaints the mismatched color so that all three match again. So if the dragon hasn't had a chance to damage two out of the three bits, then the information can be recovered successfully because it's been redundantly encoded. And we would like to use that same principle that redundant encoding protects against error, but use it for quantum systems. Well, it's not immediately obvious how to make that work. As I've already emphasized, we can't copy unknown quantum states, so we can't, for example, make a backup copy of the quantum information in a quantum computer in case the original gets damaged. And in the quantum world, we have to worry about more kinds of errors than in the classical world. It could be that the dragon opens door number one of a qubit and changes the color of the ball and then recloses the box. That would be like a bit flip error that could occur to a classical bit. But what he might do instead is open door number two of the box and change the color of the ball and reclose the box. That's what we call a phase error, which has no classical analog. And we have to be able to protect both types of errors, protect against both types of errors, without knowing which kind might have occurred. There's another way of thinking about the phase error, which is we can imagine that the dragon opens door number one of the box, and instead of flipping the color of the ball, just observes the color and remembers it. And that will have the effect of changing the color of the ball if we look through door number two. And in many physical settings, it's easier to remember the value of a bit than to flip the bit, and that makes the phase errors particularly pervasive and many different physical systems. So really the key thing is that if we want to operate a quantum computer, if we want to protect quantum information, we have to prevent any information that's being processed from leaking to the outside world. We have to perfectly seal off the information being processed from the environment or else the quantum computer will fail. And that sounds impossible because our hardware is never going to be perfect. But we've learned in principle how to do it by using quantum entanglement. So if I have one qubit that I would like to protect, I can encode that one qubit of quantum information in a highly entangled state of five qubits. And then the dragon might come along and damage in some undetermined way one of the five qubits. But because the state is highly entangled, the information that's encoded in that block of five qubits 
is not accessible when you look at the qubits one at a time. Just like we couldn't read that 100-page quantum book by looking at the pages one at a time. So the interaction of the dragon with the qubit doesn't necessarily have to damage the encoded information. And in fact, we can ask the beaver to come along and make some carefully constructed collective measurement on that block of five qubits, which will allow the beaver to diagnose the damage that was done by the dragon and reverse that damage. And the beaver, too, doesn't find out anything about what the encoded state is, which would cause the encoded information to collapse, only learns about the errors and can correct them. What makes it work is that the encoding is in a highly entangled state. So this idea of quantum error correction is that if I want to protect quantum information from the environment, I encode it in a highly entangled state in a system with many parts. <coughs> And then, the environment will typically interact with those parts one at a time. And therefore not acquire any of the information that's encoded, and therefore not damage it. And we've also learned how to coherently process information that's encoded in this highly entangled form. So we can imagine preparing an encoded state of a cat, which is alive and dead, for at the same time and maintaining that state for a very long time. And furthermore, we know how to coherently process the state of a large quantum system suitably encoded. So theorists are very excited about this idea of quantum error correction. It's kind of a theorist dream, so we wrote poems about it, including my former student Daniel Gottesman. He wrote a sonnet of which I'll just quote one part. We cannot clone for force, instead we split coherence to protect it from that wrong that would destroy our valued quantum bit and make our computation take too long. So it was just a theorist dream 20 years ago, but what's exciting is that today quantum error correction is starting to become serious laboratory science and it's now being carried out at places like Yale, now on a small scale, but with great future potential. Now, one of the heroes of this subject of quantum error correction is my Caltech colleague, Alexei Katayev. The day we met in 1997 was one of the most exciting days of my scientific life when I heard his seminar and made these notes. I felt I was hearing from Katayev ideas about quantum error correction that are potentially transformative. The main thing I learned was the connection between quantum error correction and topology. Mathematicians use the word topology to mean the properties of an object that remain invariant if we smoothly deform the object without ripping or tearing it. And likewise, we would like the way a quantum computer acts on its protected quantum information to remain invariant as we deform the computation by introducing some noise. So we'd like to use physical interactions with a topological character to do the processing. And we know of such topological interactions in physics, like the Aharonov-Ohm effect, in which the quantum state of an electron is affected by transporting the electron around a tube of magnetic flux, even though the electron never directly visits the region where the magnetic field is non-zero. And that change, that Aharonov-Ohm phase that the electron acquires remains the same if we deform the trajectory of the electron. All that matters is the winding number of the electron around the flux tube. And these types of topological interactions are much richer in two-dimensional systems. I can consider two-dimensional media that support an exotic type of particle that we call an anion. What happened here? This doesn't want to advance. Hmm. Okay. And these 
Particles have the following property. If I have a two-dimensional medium that supports many anions, there are many distinguishable quantum states of that system of many anions corresponding to different ways of fusing together the individual particles. But all of those states look identical when we examine them locally. I can't tell the difference between one state and another when I visit the anions one at a time. So that's just the type of encoding of quantum information we want to hide the information from the noise in the environment. And furthermore, we can process that information just by exchanging the anions. And so we can imagine operating a topological quantum computer which we could initialize by creating pairs of anions, then process information by performing a sequence of exchanges of the anions so that their world lines in two plus one dimensional space-time trace out a braid in space-time. And then I could read out the information by bringing the anions together pairwise to observe whether they annihilate or not and disappear. Now the beauty of this idea is that the computation has an intrinsic resistance to decoherence. If I keep the temperature low so there are no thermally excited anions diffusing around, and I keep the particles far apart from one another except at the very beginning and the very end, then as long as we execute the right braid, we're guaranteed to get the right answer in the quantum computation. So again, that's the theorist's dream. I was excited about this idea, so I wrote a poem about it. <laughs> which reads in part, Alexei exhibits a knack for persuading that someday we'll crunch quantum data by braiding, with quantum states hidden where no one can see, protected from damage through topology. Anyon, anyon, where do you roam? Braid for a while before you go home. And there's more to the poem, but you get the idea. <laughs> we think it's an exciting dream. But is it just a dream? Well, here too, technology is starting to catch up with the theorist's dream. And one way of realizing this idea uses another trick that Kataev taught us, that it's possible to cut an electron into pieces. That sounds ridiculous. An electron is an indivisible elementary particle, isn't it? But in a highly entangled world, amazing things can happen. So an example of where an electron can divide into pieces is in a one-dimensional system, a wire, a quantum wire. A quantum wire can be superconducting, that means it can conduct electricity without resistance. But there are two kinds of superconducting wire, the ordinary kind and the topological kind. And at the boundary between the two, there sits an object we call a Majorana fermion. And so if I introduce an extra electron into that segment of topological superconductor, that electron can, in effect, dissolve and disappear. And in the process, the pair of Majorana fermions at the two ends of the segment get excited. But that excitation can't be observed locally. When I look at the Majorana fermions one at a time, it's really a collective property of the two Majorana fermions. So that's an encoding of information, whether the electron was added or not which is highly non-local and therefore can be hidden from the environment. Now, there is highly suggestive experimental evidence that this type of topological encoding of information is possible in quantum wires. The more definitive experiments still need to be done to make this fully convincing, but it's very encouraging. Now, I would like to be able to process this type of topologically encoded information by exchanging particles when I'm limited to a one-dimensional wire. The way I could do that is by having T-junctions in the wires so that by controlling the boundary between topological and ordinary superconductors, say with some voltage gates, I could park one of the Majorana fermions around the corner, move the one on the right over to the left, and move the other one over to the right in effect, achieving an exchange of the two particles, that would be one step in a protected topological quantum computation. That type of topological processing of Majorana fermions hasn't yet been done experimentally, but I'm hopeful that it can be in the next couple of years. And that will be not just a step towards a promising new technology, but also a milestone in basic physics. I don't want to give the impression that this 
Topological method for encoding quantum information is the only way to build quantum hardware. There are many ways that are being pursued in different physical settings. We can imagine a qubit carried by a single atom, which could be either in its ground state or some long-lived excited state. Or we could have information encoded in a single electron, which has a spin or magnetic moment, which can be oriented either up or down, corresponding to these two states of the qubit. That's a remarkable encoding because it's just one electron carrying the information, and yet we've learned how to control that electron spin accurately and protect it from decoherence for reasonably long times. Or we could encode the information, as is done here in Yale, in a ordinary superconducting circuit. One way to do that that's easy to visualize is that we could have the persistent current in a loop of superconducting wire be either clockwise or counterclockwise. In practice, that's not really the right way to do it. There are more clever ways that work better. But it's a highly successful technology for realizing qubits, and it's really a remarkable encoding because in this case, the qubit is encoded in the collective motion of billions of electrons, and yet it behaves like a single qubit of information, like an atom or an electron spin. So I've been emphasizing, emphasizing three issues about quantum computers, which I've been thinking about for a while. One is, why would we build one? What can we do with a quantum computer? And I think the best answer we have is that with a quantum computer, we'd be able to simulate efficiently any process that occurs in a quantum system. Can we build one? Well, now that we understand the principles of quantum error correction, we're not aware of any obstacles, which as a matter of principle will prevent us from realizing large-scale quantum computers. And how will we build one? What kind of quantum hardware is the right kind to use? Well, as I've emphasized, there are many different approaches to building quantum hardware that are being pursued. And it's important that these be pursued in parallel. Each one might find its own technological niche or even a hybrid technology that makes use of several different types of hardware could turn out to be important. I felt for quite a while that, although this is already a compelling research agenda, that as our ideas about quantum information processing advance, we should expect those ideas to connect to other problems in physics. And we're starting to see that happen in recent years. And a lot of those connections have to do with what we call the monogamy of entanglement. Classical correlations are polyamorous. That means they can be shared in many different ways. So for example, Adam and Betty can both read the same newspaper, and that means they have the same information and they become correlated with one another. But nothing prevents Charlie from reading that newspaper too. And then he's just as strongly correlated with Betty and with Adam as Adam and Betty are with one another. Quantum correlations are different. They're harder to share. So that if Betty and Adam are very strongly entangled with one another, then Betty has used up all her ability to entangle with Adam. And Betty and Adam can't be correlated with Charlie at all. And if, on the other hand, Betty and Charlie are fully entangled with one another, then they can't be correlated with Adam at all. That's the monogamy of entanglement. And the monogamy can be frustrating. Betty might want to entangle with both Adam and Charlie, but if she wants to get more entangled with Charlie, she can do so only by sacrificing some of her entanglement with Adam. And that monogamy has many different ramifications. It's important in cryptography because Adam and Betty could try to use their entangled state to generate a secret key that can be used to encrypt and decrypt a private message that they exchange. And if they have a way of verifying that they're highly entangled with one another, then they can be assured that Charlie won't be correlated with that key. He won't know their secret key, so their privacy will be protected. Monogamy is important in the study of quantum matter. Because if I have a system of many particles, many electrons, say, each pair of electrons may want to become entangled with one another. But each time an electron becomes more entangled with one of its neighbors, it will have to be less entangled with other neighbors. So the electrons are frustrated. 
and they have to find some optimal way of sharing their entanglement, which makes them as happy as possible. And that gives rise to different phases of quantum matter in which the entanglement is shared in different ways, and we're trying to understand and classify those quantum phases. And monogamy is also important in gravitational physics, in particular in the study of black holes. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to explain that. Classically, a black hole is something from which nothing can escape. If an astronaut is foolish enough as to enter a black hole, to cross its event horizon, she will never be able to return to the outside or send a message to the outside. But quantumly, as we've known for 40 years, black holes can radiate. They emit Hawking radiation. And eventually, a black hole will radiate away all of its mass and disappear. And that raises the question of what happens to the information that fell into the black hole and was lost behind the horizon. If black holes are like other objects which emit thermal radiation, then we would expect that information to be still present to survive, but to be very highly scrambled, to be encoded in a way that's so scrambled that it would be very hard to read in practice, but in principle, the information still exists. But black holes are different from other objects in the important respect that a black hole has an event horizon. And what that means, I've tried to depict in this picture, a space-time diagram with time going upward. The geometry of a black hole is so deformed that it's possible to draw a slice, which I've shown here in green, which is really a space-like slice. It's a slice of a single time. And yet it crosses both the collapsing body from which the black hole formed and nearly all of the Hawking radiation that was emitted while the black hole was evaporating. So if quantum information is encoded in that collapsing body and it is revealed in some form in the Hawking radiation, that means the same quantum information is really in two places at the same time. In other words, the information has been copied. But that's cloning of quantum information, which I argued earlier, is impossible. So now we're really stuck because we either have to believe that information is destroyed and give up on a central tenet of quantum theory that evolution is microscopically reversible or accept that cloning occurs. Either way, the foundations of quantum theory would need revision. Well, thinking about this back in the 1990s, we came up with the idea called black hole complementarity. And the idea is that we shouldn't think of the inside and the outside of a black hole as two separate subsystems of a single system. Instead, for reasons that aren't obvious and which a theory of quantum gravity would have to explain, the correct view is that we should think of the inside and the outside as complementary ways of looking at one and the same system. One point of view is appropriate for the observer who stays outside the black hole, the other point of view is appropriate for the observer who falls through the horizon and enters the black hole interior. But because these are just two views of the same quantum system, there's no cloning necessary for the information to be in both the collapsing body and the outgoing radiation. And evidence accumulated over some years thereafter that this idea of black hole complementarity is on the right track. But then I ran into trouble a few years ago through the work of the group known as AMPS. Black hole complementarity seeks to reconcile three ideas, each of which on its own seems quite reasonable. On the one hand, a black hole doesn't destroy information, but merely scrambles it up, puts it in a form which is difficult to read. On the other hand, an observer who falls, oops, an observer who falls through the horizon of a black hole doesn't notice anything unusual at the moment of horizon crossing, at the moment of entering the black hole. Though later on, that observer will be crushed at the singularity inside. <coughs> and third, that an observer who stays outside the black hole doesn't see any unexpected violations of the usual rules of local quantum physics. And AMPS argued that these three ideas can't all be compatible, that we have to give up at least one of them. And they advocated that the conservative resolution of the conflict is to give up on two. 
that instead of an observer being able to pass through a black hole horizon unscathed, that observer would be immediately destroyed right at the moment of horizon crossing in a seething firewall. That's a crazy claim because it's not at all what we find when we solve the gravitational field equations to learn about the black hole geometry. So why would these smart people make this crazy claim? It's because of the monogamy of entanglement. Because Amps argued that if it's true that an observer who falls through the black hole horizon doesn't notice anything unusual at the moment of horizon crossing, then that means that black hole radiation that's being emitted right now has to be highly entangled with degrees of freedom that are inside the black hole. On the other hand, if information really does get revealed as a black hole evaporates, then that means when the black hole has been evaporated for a very long time, the Hawking radiation that's coming out today should be highly entangled with radiation that was emitted earlier. And if the rules of local quantum physics are the usual ones outside the horizon, if it's going to be entangled with system C after it's pulled away from the black hole, it has to already be entangled with system C when it's very close to the horizon. And now we have a problem because system B just outside the black hole, wants to be highly entangled both with the inside and with the earlier radiation, and it can't have it both ways because of the monogamy of entanglement. And Amps proposed to relieve the tension by breaking the entanglement between A and B. But that would mean that the black hole horizon would be a highly energetic place, the firewall. And we're still really puzzled about this. It exposed that we don't understand very well what the interior of a black hole is because of subtle quantum effects. And the main reason I'm telling you about this is that this observation might have been made decades ago, but it occurred relatively recently because only in the last few years have we grown accustomed to thinking about other problems in physics, including gravitational physics, from the point of view of entanglement dynamics and the properties of quantum information. So how are we going to make progress on a problem like this one? How, how are we going to understand what's inside a black hole? Well, our best hope is to pursue the best idea we have about quantum gravity, which is the holographic principle. Now, this principle asserts that contrary to naive expectations, all the information in a room like this auditorium encoded in our brains and our smartphones and so on can actually be read on the boundary of the room, the floor and the walls and the ceiling, but it's encoded on the boundary in some very, very highly entangled form that's extremely difficult to read. In fact, we can think of the geometry of the room, who in the auditorium is sitting close to other people, as being encoded in the quantum entanglement on the boundary. So it seems that it's really the entanglement which determines how space is held together, which points are close to other points. The geometry, according to the holographic principle, or so it now seems, is an emergent property of a very highly entangled system that lives on the boundary. We had a talk at Caltech last year by Robert Digraff, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and he was reviewing theoretical physics and he showed this slide, which indicates how the different ideas of theoretical physics fit together. And I thought it was striking that he put quantum information right in the center of things. He wouldn't have done that five years earlier because it's only relatively recently that the idea that quantum information really is at the core of the deepest questions in physics has started to gain traction. But I would like to go further than digraph. I would erase the theoretical from the diagram because quantum information really is an experimental science as practiced at places like Yale. And if it's really true that we can think of quantum geometry as an emergent feature of very highly entangled systems, then that means that we ought to be able to perform experiments on highly entangled systems 
to gain insights into the quantum properties of geometry. So I expect that in the coming decades, at a university like Yale, on a tabletop in a laboratory, we'll be able to do experiments with highly entangled systems, which will give us insights into quantum gravity that would be very hard to acquire without experimental guidance. So the way I like to think about quantum information science is that we are at the early stages of the exploration of a new frontier of physics. We might call it the complexity frontier or entanglement frontier. This is different from the short distance frontier we explore in particle physics or the long distance frontier of cosmology. But like those, it's very fundamental and exciting. We are just now acquiring and perfecting the tools to build and control very precisely highly complex quantum systems with many particles, systems that are highly entangled, systems that are so complex that we can't simulate them with our digital computers or very well predict how they'll behave with our existing theoretical tools. And that's opening great opportunities for new discoveries. And Yale is one of the institution's leading advances at the entanglement frontier, so I'm especially glad to be here this week. At Caltech also we have an institute for quantum information and matter dedicated to exploring the entanglement frontier. And at Caltech we have a slogan, a tagline, nature is subtle. This is meant to do homage to Einstein's famous pronouncement, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. But the fact is, despite all his genius, Einstein was underestimating the subtlety of nature when he dismissed quantum entanglement as spooky action at a distance. And our aim in quantum information science now is to explore, enjoy, exploit the subtlety of the quantum world in all its many facets and ramifications. So thanks for listening to me today. And at tomorrow's lecture, I hope I'll see many of you, well, I'll discuss in greater depth the connections between quantum information and gravitation. Thanks. So we have time for a few questions. Yes. So when you were describing the error correction ideas of how you benefit from the fact that the information is sort of delocalized over all the humans, um, I mean, there are non-quantum things like holographic storage of information that based on waves and interference that have this, many of the same properties. So are these error correction methods really depending on entanglement, or are they more about wave interference? It's really entanglement, because even with those holographic uh, classical encodings of information, if you look at a small part of a hologram, it certainly doesn't allow you to reconstruct the whole picture. But it does give you some significant information about the image that's holographically stored. And these entangled encodings aren't like that. You can look at a big hunk of the quantum memory and still know almost nothing about the encoded state. Yes? How do you measure the entanglement between, if you have like two qubits? Because you keep saying you made a distinction between fully entangled and not entangled. Is there like a, how do you place the entanglement on a spectrum between those two lines? So the question is, how do you measure the entanglement? And the answer is, it's not an easy thing to measure. And if I, have many identically prepared copies of the system, then I can make measurements, make different measurements on different copies and thereby reconstruct enough about the quantum state to determine the entanglement. But um, in general, it's not a very easy thing to measure. There are um, actually some, some neat ideas about how you can measure quantities related to entanglement that tell you about the global properties of uh, quantum correlations, uh, but they won't really give you exactly the, uh, well, I didn't even say how to quantify entanglement. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But there is a way to do it. 
You can quantify entanglement essentially by asking how much information is missing if you look at part A of the system, and that means you're learning about um, what an observer who's confined to part A can find out. And that observer is going to be missing some of the information in part A because it's correlated with part B. And so one way to do it is to have many copies, make different measurements in part A and part B, but in the single copy case, it's hard. using a quantum computer better than we can do with a classical one. So um, is the value add entirely from the fact that you can do more computations at a time and it's much faster? Or are there any types of computations that you can't do using classical bits that you can with a qubit? Yeah, so so that, the question is, where does the advantage of the quantum computer really come from? And the question was framed as, is it coming from the fact that you can do many computations simultaneously? This is actually a pretty subtle question. So I was a little, I was a bit cagey in not putting it exactly the way you did, although you'll often hear people describe the advantage of a quantum computer that way. It is true that if we um, consider a superposition of many classical states, we can run the computation once and only once and to simulate with a classical computer what that computation does. It seems like we would have to run the classical computation many times. But the reason I don't like putting it quite that way is it's a little bit misleading because in the end you're going to have to read something out to get the result of the computation. And you're quite limited in the information you can extract in that final measurement. And so the power really comes from designing your quantum algorithm in a sufficiently clever way that those different parts of the computation interfere with one another constructively on the right answer. And that's why it's really an art to designing quantum algorithms that have advantages over classical algorithms. And why, in many cases, we don't think profound quantum speed ups of the computational problem are possible. <coughs> I didn't say this, but for the hardest types of problems that classical computers can, solve where we can check the answer efficiently, the problems you know, we call NP-complete. Um, quantum computers can speed those up a little bit, but not nearly as profoundly as they speed up uh, problems like factoring. So the, the problem has to be pretty well matched to the special capabilities of a quantum computer for a very big speed up to be possible. I couldn't hear you, I'm so sorry. So when you observe a superimposed qubit, mm -hmm. you collapse it into one of two states always? It's always one or two? and that's No, it could be one of many. It could be one of many. So is there a reason why I seem to imagine using Boolean logic when you're, people are talking about the sorts of things? Like you, you, you said that the things that are quantumly easy surround the things that are classically oh. easy, but I've always kind of thought of them as being completely separate domains of computation. It, what's more, what's closer to the reality? So the question is, why did I draw that diagram of uh, classically easy with quantum easy uh, being uh, a larger containing set? Aren't they really completely separate things? Well, what I meant by that is that, in principle, if you had a very well-controlled quantum computer, you could use it to do a classical computation. It's pretty easy in principle to get a quantum computer to simulate a classical computer and therefore solve any problem the classical computer can solve, it's hard to do it the other way, to get a classical computer to simulate a quantum computer. Of course, it would be kind of a stupid thing nowadays to give you the, your classical problem to a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. um, maybe someday quantum computers will be so advanced that uh, it won't be so foolish. But that was all I meant, that a quantum computer, at least uh, conceptually, can easily simulate a classical one. Yeah, NP-complete, we believe, is outside quantum easy. But there are also problems that are in quantum easy which are not in NP at all. In other words, it's not necessarily the case that a problem that can be solved quickly 
by a quantum computer can, we can easily verify the answer with a classical computer. And many of the quantum simulation problems have that feature. So let me remind everyone that tomorrow's lecture is here at the same time, but Thursday's lecture is at the Quantum Institute, fourth floor of Hill House 17. Let's thank John one last time.